Hello, everyone, and welcome. You are listening to Dispatches, conversations about getting through the COVID crisis with community care, mutual aid, and personal and collective resilience. Today, you are going to hear from Leah and Bong Che, who are coming to us from South Korea. Leah is an expat and Bong is Korean. This conversation was so delightful for me and also held some surprises because we started out talking about why Korea has been so successful at flattening the curve without ever having a stay-at-home order. And the answers have to do with abundant testing and cool and effective apps that help you navigate public spaces, but also with a cultural orientation that honors the collective and asserts everyone's role in keeping each other safe. But then the conversation evolved, and I got a big education about how Korea impeached their corrupt president in 2016 through four months of mass protests called the Candlelight Protests. This conversation was really inspiring for me and really rich, and hearing this incredible mass mobilization of regular people just highlighted for me the degree to which here in the U.S. resistance tactics like protests have been so thoroughly marginalized and cast as a thing that we needed in the past and as trivial, immature, and ineffective when they are not any of those things. Most of all, this conversation was a beacon of hope and a perspective for me that the way we're doing things here right now is not the way that they have to be. This perspective is something that I am craving right now. So I also want to tell you quickly how these folks came into my life. So Leah and I knew each other and were the ones that set up the interview, and I asked Bong kind of last minute if he would join us. So that's part of why you'll hear Leah take the lead here. Leah and I haven't ever met or talked on the phone, but we've connected pretty intimately because a mutual friend connected us last year when we were both pregnant. We were both over 40 and having our first babies, and we exchanged messages and support and camaraderie during a very unique and strange time. And I remember really noticing that the stress and the pressure of being pregnant lifted a veil between me and other people who were in similar situations and that we could foster quick and potent connection. And I'm saying all of that here because I feel a similar veil lifted between people inside of the pandemic. That inside of the extreme stress and isolation and the horror, there's also more connection, more courage, and more tenderness for each other. And I'm your host, Becca Tilson. I'm an organizer, a movement baby, a somatics practitioner, and a mother living in Duwamish territory, otherwise known as Seattle. We started this podcast in the tradition of our community organizing ancestors who taught us that we need each other and that we have each other, and that even in these unprecedented times, we collectively do have what it takes to meet this moment with creativity, love, and grit. So without further ado, here is Leah and Bong. Hi. (laughs) Oh, you guys stayed up so late. This is my husband. Hi, Bong. Nice to meet you. Am I saying your name right? Yeah, just like water bong. Great. And you live in South Korea? Yes. Yeah. This this little, um, our town called Gime is a suburb of Busan, and it has very few people with coronavirus, people who have actually been diagnosed. We get um, government um, alert text messages, and it tells us when someone is diagnosed. And then it tells you where the person lives and where they have traveled, what businesses they went to, what bus they took, um, the neighborhood they live in. And you can go actually onto the local government website and you can see a map that shows their, um, where they've been for the last, I think, two weeks before they were um, diagnosed. Mm-hmm. You call the hotline and you say, I have these symptoms, or you go to a testing center and get tested. And if you're positive, then you call the hotline and tell them that you've tested positive and they take down all your information. They ask you all the questions. Where did you go um, for the last two weeks? It doesn't share the person's name, right? Just shares um, their age, their sex, and their neighborhood where they live. Well, and all the places they've been and the restaurants they've been. And all the places at. they've been in the last week or two. And the, this government are doing pretty good, well organized, I think. Yeah. And you don't have to pay for treatment. And, uh, if you're diagnosed uh, positive, the government pays for your uh, treatment in the hospital. And it's very easy to find information. Right. Which hospitals, so you look on the app and it'll tell you which hospitals are available for 
um, health care for COVID-19 for um, hospital care, like which hospitals are taking patients and which aren't. That's in the app? Um, yeah. It, it tells you where to go. We could prepare for uh, where is not to go, uh, where, where is not the place to go, where is it okay to go, you know? So in Korea, oh. we had very few uh, coronavirus infections at first in January, very few, less than 100, maybe yeah. 50 or something like that. It was very few. And then this church cult that had connections with Wuhan, China, they had members going back and forth between China and Korea and hiding the fact. Wow. That's right. And um, one of the church members, a woman, they believe it started with this specific woman, but probably was a bunch of members. They got sick. But the um, leader of the church told them, do not go to the hospital. Do not get tested. Mm. So we went from under 100 cases. Super spreading. Um, right. Yeah. They call her the super spreader. Um, to a, a week later, we were um, over 1,000. And then mm. it just went up and up and up and up. And once it started, though, that's when the government really started um, aggressively testing. They got um, a test centers set up everywhere in every small town. There's a test center. There are drive-through test centers. Our national health care system covers uh, 50% of the cost of the test. So I think it's about normally like $75 or something like that. But if you test positive, it's free. Mm -hmm. And then your health care, um, if you have to go to the hospital, is also taken care of. It's free. That is an incentive to get tested and get um, taken care of and be separated from the healthy people. So when I go back to Daegu... Daegu my, is the place where this all started. Uh, Daegu City for my work. I was very afraid to go there at the time. Right. You know? If that city becomes a hot spot, I didn't have any information which place is very dangerous. So I tried to find the application, and it shows every everything. I could find a very safe restaurant. You know, you could avoid the places where yeah. known right, yeah. coronavirus patients had eaten. Amazing. Yeah. So it's not just that there's one app that really works. There are many apps that really work that mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. gather the same information and help people yeah. stay safe, help people know if they yeah. potentially yeah. have been exposed. A bunch of different map apps that, that show, like the different maps that show different things. So one map will show how many people have been diagnosed in what parts of the country, and it shows a graph and stuff. And then there's a different map that um, shows where the pharmacies are that are selling masks for your day. Uh, there was a shortage of face masks here. So um, the government started um, mandating people with um, odd number of birth years can go to get their masks on this day. And people with even number of birthdays can go on this day. And you look at the map to see which pharmacies have the masks and what time they start selling the masks so you can go get in line for your allotment of two masks per person. That's really interesting because we started getting told that it didn't protect us if you didn't have the virus to wear a mask and it could actually, there's all this stuff out there about how it could actually make you more susceptible because you touch your face more and maybe it even puts germs closer to your face but in other countries people are wearing masks all the time so now we're we're wondering if we're just being told that because we have this incredible shortage it doesn't necessarily protect you by wearing the mask what protects you is if everyone is wearing the mask then the virus doesn't get spread as easily because sometimes you don't know you have the virus. There's a lot of people walking around asymptomatic or with very mild symptoms and they're coughing and breathing everywhere. So if they're not wearing a mask, their spread goes farther. But if everyone's wearing the mask, then that stops the spread a little bit more. Can I say something? Yeah. It becomes one of the way to being having a manner on community these days. 
when you get on the elevator without mask, people are gonna look at you. Hey, what are you doing? Take your mask like that, you know. Mm. <laughs> so mask not gonna protect someone from the coronavirus one hundred percent. But uh, we we are thinking about saving the very important saving a face. Everyone has to do it. And if you're not doing it, then you're basically acting shameful. Yeah. Nobody wants to be the public enemy. Right. So when someone who has a coronavirus goes to the restaurant, visit the restaurant, or go to the company, it has to be shut down. That's why we wear the mask on every day, and it's like it becomes like a manner. That's a totally different point compared to USA. So I agree with you. I think here... I don't think that people are as connected to their role in protecting other people. Nobody knows I got, I'm the person who carried the carry virus before having a symptom. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. You're saying we we are projecting the stigma onto each other and onto you for wearing the masks. And really what you're saying is so rational. It's like, if everybody wears it, then everybody's taking care of everybody else. And I don't think we are connected to that here. So tonight, today, topic is about coronavirus, how to protect, uh, prevent uh, the, spread. the spread. So when I think about different point compared to other country, Europe or Western country and Korea, first of all, Korea government is well organized by democracy, right? Do you have you heard about the uh, big changes four years before? There was um, we had an impeachment. Pro- yeah, impeachment. Okay, yeah, maybe. And our less than I should know. Yeah, tell us. Actually, got put in jail. Oh. Yeah, the impeachment actually worked like it was supposed. Can to. I say? Yeah. Yeah. So this government, they are doing their business couldn't do well. A lot of corruption. The corruption. And that we do one big accident. Yeah, the, the disaster uh, Ships. of a ferry. There was a ferry from Seoul to um, Jeju Island. an island. Uh, but this ferry was taking middle school. High school. High school? Oh, high school students. High school students. It was a field trip. And the company supplying the ferries... Um, <laughs> was corrupt and so they had not um checked the safety um and the uh, seaworthiness of their ferries and so it sprung a leak or something i don't know it was sinking and then the issue was they were not rescued they were on this sinking boat for how long a day Mm-hmm. And they were not rescued. There was no organization. There was no government response to rescue these children. And they were hiding. So most of the children died. And then the government tried to cover up the fact that they had dropped the ball and allowed all these children to die. And that's what really galvanized yeah. um, the middle-aged, middle-class mothers and fathers grandmothers and and parents of these children um, organized and campaigned a lot um, to uh, deal with this um, corrupt government. Wow. The whole South Korean people was upset and we impeached and we tried to change the government system. We realized as too much corruption, we realized we we are not the fucking animal. who can end <laughs> by stupid politician. We could make change like that. It, that and, president was impeached and put in jail. The heads of the companies that were in her pocket were also put in jail. There was a big house cleaning, basically, where all these corrupt members of not just the government, but also the companies that were working hand in hand a lot of people ended up in jail. Um, and then this government's doing pretty good. Could help us to prevent coronavirus crisis. You know? So I know this is a question that you probably might not be able to answer, but I'm just reeling here from the story that you just told me. 
that you had a corrupt president and then something happened and you were able to successfully impeach that president. That president stopped being the president and went to jail along with a bunch of corrupt people. So hypothetically, if we were to be in that situation, (laughs) it, it feels like that reality is so far from what's yeah. actually people can envision happening. How is it that you could do that? Like, it feels like corrupt people do so many corrupt things to stay in power. How is it that you could get this person out of power? How can I say? The we protest person? with candle. Many, many people jo- join that movement. It, it's about yeah. hive mentality. There is well, it's about power. collective power. You protested. Yes. You you held candles. You said everybody was holding <laughs> uh, holding the candle, okay. a, a lit candle. So it became known as the candle protest. Because... So, wow. And after that, I changed my mind. I tried to fight to fight with corruption also, but I was mm-hmm. not one of the mem- main member who has the group. <laughs> no, like it party, really, like <laughs> it, that's what made it so amazing it was a national movement it wasn't people who were connected by organizations it was individual koreans all coming together to work as a whole it wasn't just the radical people it was yeah. regular people just regular people yeah. over a million people over a million people from wow. all, all around in every part of the country people did not let up they told all of the government, local and national, you have to do something. We demand that you do something. And after, how long did it take? Almost a year? Six months, I think. How is it that in the U.S. um, or in Korea, everybody could protest like that? It's possible in Mm. Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Rene. More than revolution itself. I'll be back. We in view of the years. Hi, everyone. So while Leah goes to check on their baby, um, we spend a while having tech difficulties and the calls drop. So I want to take a chance to let you know that in a few minutes, you'll hear me reference the WTO protests. And I want to let you know that the WTO is the World Trade Organization, which shapes global trade to the benefit of big business and rich countries. And in 1999, the WTO tried to have a meeting in Seattle, and many, many of us gathered and waged massive protests that successfully closed the meetings and didn't let them continue after a week. So these protests were really significant. And if you don't know about that history, check it out in the show notes and in the credits of this podcast. There we go. It's okay. I turn his Bob Marley on. Now he's good. <laughs> Ronan likes Bob Marley. Yeah, uh, I we discovered um, when, he, when he went through his, um, you know, the two month crying every night phase that babies go through. That was what soothed him. Amazing. And it still works every nap, every nap, every night. Sometimes that legend. stuff makes me believe in past lives. Right? Because I played Mozart to my belly. Yeah. He came out, he had no interest in Mozart at all. Just likes reggae. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering for both of you, like what it felt like to be in those candle protests and be connected with so many people participating in something and then what it felt like to win. I got it, I got it, I got you. Okay, I can say, uh, before protest, everything was very prostrate to me. But now I'm very satisfied Mm. to living in my country. I'm very proud of my country too. I like my country now. I was in shock. I couldn't believe that they did it. Yeah? Mm-hmm. What was it like for you, Leah? I was just amazed. I was just amazed. I was amazed. Like, how could they How could they do it, it? It was right after Trump was elected. That's why. So it was like, for me, it was like, hey, hey, U.S., hey, take note. Look, this is how you do it. This is how it's done. Yeah, I, I was very proud of myself, too. Mm. 
and I, we made it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. How did it? How did it feel when you found out? Where? What was? Was there a party? What did it feel like inside? That's the, just the celebration <laughs> everywhere, across the country. Everywhere, not only Seoul, but also countryside. I was like, wow, party. Party, what kind of party? Just a whole, whole street was party. <laughs> it's kind of a feeling it's hard to describe. It's kind of all in the body and in the heart. I remember the day that we, so we had the, these really big WTO protests in 1999 in Seattle, and we shut down the WTO over five days and kicked the WTO out of Seattle. And the day, the moment that we figured out, that we found out that, that the WTO had asked Seattle if they could stay through the weekend, it was on Friday, and they, Seattle said no. It was really late at night, and I was um, leading a, a lockdown of the Westin Hotel which was a big hotel that a lot of delegates were in. And we had a couple hundred people. It wasn't that big. It was a lot of people who had been arrested and people were all over protesting at the jail and different places. And we had this little lockdown. And it was one of the first nights of Hanukkah. And we uh, crowdsourced some candles and we made a menorah on a, a pothole. And I told a story that my dad t- always told me about Hanukkah that wasn't religious. It was very much about people taking care of each other and that the miracle of Hanukkah is that over eight days the community thought that they didn't have enough but they did have enough because people came out like people made stone soup and just came out and took care of each other and um and we found out in the middle of that night locking down the West End that we had won and the WTO was leaving Seattle and they had not finished their meeting and there is no other feeling I have ever had, and I think I will ever have, that's like that feeling. And we partied. I remember looking at the faces of people who I had been in the streets with all week, people I had just met and people I knew for years, and crying and just the mm. joy on our faces was mm-hmm. incredible. And when you talk about it, when I look at you, Bong, I remember the feeling I had Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's so hard to describe that. That's right. Do you have any messages for our listeners? Definitely. If they want to do something, if they if they feel like they, they're um, at home and there's there's nothing they can do and it's out of their control, I would say bug your local representative to start testing. Testing. It's mass testing. It's being able to understand where the cases are and get them yeah. quarantined because that's how you get this thing under control. Thank you. Bong, that's do you have any say. last do thoughts? Final... Oh. What <laughs> words What and... words do you have for the American people? As Bama is saying, get up, stand up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Goodbye, friends. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into Dispatches. I want to dedicate today's episode to one of my chosen ancestors whom I just lost. Ellie Bluestein died at 91 years old on April 7, 2020. Ellie was an organizer and an activist her whole life, and in her 20s, she met my grandmother, Rachel, and they became best friends and chosen sisters. My grandma knew how to create chosen families, so when she left far too early, she left me Ellie, and over the past 20 years, I have gone to visit her whenever I could. Being with Ellie helped me reground myself inside a legacy of social justice work that was bigger than my current life and my peer groups, and that is a part of what propels me to create dispatches right now. On our website, you can find a picture of Ellie meeting my baby this last December. Ellie was fiery and smart and hilarious and loving, and she will be dearly missed by many. Much love and gratitude to Ellie Bluestein. For more about the WTO, there is a fabulous new website that organizers created for the 20th anniversary. You can find the link in our show notes or at shutdownwto20.org. There's also a fantastic documentary that was created just after the WTO called This is What Democracy Looks Like, and it was created by our own editor of this episode, Jill Irene Friedberg and Richard Rowley. Dispatches is a Kitchen Dance Party production. Producers are myself, Becca Tilson, Basil Shadid, and Molly Tilson. Today's episode was edited by Jill Irene Friedberg. Many thanks to all of our friends and supporters.
If you like what we're up to at Dispatches, please rate and review us. Please subscribe. Please tell your friends about us. And if you have an idea of a person we should talk to or a story we should tell, please get at us at our forum on our website. Until next time, remember that we need each other and we have each other.